different nations of different people represent from different uh, peoples from all over the world to come here and basically inform and be informed about uh, human rights uh, uh, human rights violations or uh, humanitarian crisis all over the world, past or present. Because we feel like you know, with knowledge, we'll be able to work better together and we'll be able to understand each other, we'll be able to respect each other and hopefully pull our knowledge together, pull our wisdom together, we'll be able to prevent future that tragic uh, events from happening. This year, uh, we take a little detour. Uh, we decided to invite Hong Kong a representative back because we felt the situation there is uh, critical. And uh, there, there's a need for people in the Taiwan's American community to understand more about Hong Kong, to understand more about what their 
uh, demanding what, what they are, what the degrees are. Uh, we can see from a lot of indirect evidence that uh, people there are just not satisfied uh, with the current food condition. Uh, there are more Hong Kong people moving to Taiwan uh, every month, according to official data. And um, there are people there, once they get to Taiwan, they start uh, being a little bit more liberal about their opinions over there. And, and we feel like this is something that we all need to uh, get an understanding of. And so we're very, very thankful that uh, Dr. Charles Max, representing Hong Kong Forum, here today to, to, to share with us his insights. And lastly, uh, I hope this event will be another step, yeah, another step in still for future events which will come. And I hope people who want to know more about uh, the events that's going on in other parts of the world, they can come back every year to learn. Uh, last year we had a representative from Uyghur and also Tibetan uh, and Hong Kong. And, and this year we have Hong Kong again. Next year we'll hopefully first time from some other nations. So thank you once again, and continue to support Papa, and continue to support uh, Formosa Social for Human Rights, and also all other uh, representatives that's uh, that are here today. I mean, uh, hand over this microphone to, uh, to former president of Human Rights Association. Uh, thank you for everybody who's joining this conference today. Uh, it's an honor of our organization of the Formosa Association of Human Rights to participate in this Taiwan to do and the future Hong Kong to do conference. Uh, my name is Tony Lee, and the uh, previous president of the uh, uh, organization. I'm also the, the member of the WAPA. After World War II, Chiang Kai-shek occupied Taiwan under the order of the airline force. They brought corruption to Taiwan, cultural shock to the Taiwanese. Chiang Kai-shek brought the steering, occupied government position in Taiwan, excluded Taiwanese to particip participate in government, high unemployment in Taiwan, and the high inflation and economic disaster to Taiwan. 1947, Taiwan could not tolerate anymore. Therefore, to do it occurred. Taiwanese at that time only request for democracy. However, Chinese Chiang Kai-shek give the Taiwanese for massacre mas instead of a democracy. Why, why are all the Taiwanese attorneys, doctors, business leaders, newspaper publisher, and the politician, politicians for the detail of the 228 incident, the next speaker, Dr. Wen, will give us more detail. At the same time, 2014 in Hong Kong, the Breda movement, some people call it Breda, the Breda revolution. The people of Hong Kong are asking for a general election without the restrictions. However, the Chinese Communist Party gave the Hong Kong political leader for jail. Similarity between the Taiwan and Hong Kong are a little different. Killing, reverse, the jailing. However, the Chinese mentality are the same. If you don't obey me, I will kill you, jail you, or crush you. Mr. Lin, President of Hong Kong, Sai will give us more detail about Hong Kong after the umbrella movement. Uh, finally, I appreciate all the audience to participate in this total aid event. Hopefully you will get something from this event today. Wish all of us learn from the history of Taiwan and Hong Kong. And hopefully the transition justice in Taiwan can get through smoothly and the democracy of the Hong Kong can be preserved. Finally, I wish Hong Kong to be a nation. Thank you very much. Next, uh, sorry, can we have um, yeah, Dr. Wang here, please, to tell us a little bit about his work. Nice to meet you. I hope this is loud enough for people. Um, 
First, I'd like to thank the organizers of this discussion meeting, giving me the opportunity to present what I thought about this 2 to 8 event, uh, sick incident in Taiwan. Although I have uh, co authored with Dan Wan Jin, uh, Bihen, a book on 2 to 8. Quite a while ago, and then we revised it last year. And I also have written a couple of articles about 228 in the past, but all of them were done in Chinese, uh, in Chinese language. So this is the first time for me to prepare the talk in English. But it really gave me a good opportunity to rethink the entire event and what it meant to Taiwanese what was the effect. And <coughs> because of the shortage of time, uh, I didn't put in enough uh, of, uh, image or drawing because I was hoping to add more images like uh, we have seen those uh, uh, posters on the wall or the picture. Uh, so my talk would be, the style would be mainly in the written uh, thing, but I hope it would not uh, Boy, you. Okay, let's start. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I call this is a very unfortunate turning point for Taiwanese. Because at the end of World War II, um, the Allies handed temporary administration, administrative control to Chiang Kai shek. And this is supposed to be just a kind of receiving surrender from the Japanese army and have a temporary control of the island. But Chiang Kai-shek was very well prepared. He planned way ahead and sent his follower, a gifted <coughs> politician, Chen Yi, to Taiwan and appointed him the governor general and also made Taiwan a colony, a colony, uh, a kind of inheriting from the Japanese. Uh, this is really a very unfortunate turning point. Okay, next. And the fact the Taiwanese first saw on October 15 were about 12,000 Chiang kai Six army soldiers. They were severely dressed and physically very weak and extremely undisciplined. They arrived in the seaport and uh, all the Taiwanese who went there were shaking their hands. They couldn't believe this kind of army can defeat the Japanese. And what is even worse was two months, less than two months after their arrival, they began to rob openly robbed, even wearing their own uniform, the regiment in Taipei or, or other cities. This is really a shocking uh, thing for the Taiwanese to observe. The next. Okay. Politically arranged that all the supervisory position in government were filled by the relative or friend, uh, friend of Chiang kai uh, and uh, Chen Yi's and uh, their associates. Uh, they will occupy most of the higher positions. And among the lower level government employees, some Taiwanese were able to keep the job there, but the salary they received was less than one half of the salary received by the Chinese counterpart of the similar uh, positions. Okay, next. Okay. Essentially, this is just a, a new colonial rule. And the uh, point worse is that uh, the administration is totally lacking the rule of law. And while the Taiwanese 
at that time were already very accustomed to the rule of law. Okay. This, this again, a kind of culture shock. Uh, we just couldn't uh, accept it. That kind of new rulers. And uh, the police station, there are several levels of police station on the provincial level, the city and Tambi level, or even the village level, are filled with the Chinese who essentially have no law enforcement experience. And uh, in addition, the governor general created a new law enforcement unit, which was all over the island and uh, they just practice extortion, try to get money from the uh, resident, from the citizen. The next piece. And uh, this is the one also very shocking is the, to levy the head tax. The head tax is the one practiced by all the colonizers. Colonizers, uh, just even the British did that, and the Japanese, of course. They, they be taxed on each person, every head in the colony. Uh, uniformly, each one has to pay a certain amount. And the Chiang Kai shek, of course, will never give this up. This is the good source of the money they can get. Okay. And then the other thing is Taiwan actually produced quite a bit of uh, raw material or product like rice, sugar, and even at that time, the coal, tea, sulfur, a lot of things. And during or before the war, all of this was mostly exported to Japan. Okay. And in exchange for that, the Taiwanese get some product from Japan. But this time, it will be one-way street, and all controlled by the trade office. They control everything were exporting to mainland China at that time. Okay, next week. After all this, okay, and then another thing is the, the freedom of association and the freedom of press were severely restricted. The Taiwanese who were able to organize some kind of society or association even under the control of the Japanese they, they thought they can do that under the Chinese rule, but they were very much restricted. Some of them were even de demanded to disband. And so the Taiwanese were very, very resentful of the corrupt conduct of Chinese authority and uh, also the rampant robberies of the committed by the Chinese army soldiers. The, the turning, turning from disappointment to anger. The next piece. The other thing is the very unprecedented plunder. The Japanese government and the business people actually left a lot of assets, factory, uh, even the store or uh, housing. And Chiang Kai Shek followers, they came and then seized most of them and then took out uh, the product or even the raw material and machinery and then shifted them to Shanghai and all into the private warehouse, become their private properties. Okay, next week. So, with all of this, just less than two years, maybe just about 16 months after the Chinese arrival. Okay, from October of 1945 to about January of uh, 1947. The, the entire island is almost in turmoil. Okay, the un unemployment rate was unacceptably high, especially for the Taiwanese soldiers who served in the Japanese army fighting the Second World War overseas, and they were dispatched back to Taiwan 
uh, shortly after the war, they, they couldn't find any job. And the inflation rate was terribly high. And the main cause of the inflation was the Chinese policy of currency is to keep printing it. Any department under his uh, administration, if they need any budget, they will just print the currency. No wonder the price just keep going up. And uh, this led to many impoverished people. They just couldn't afford to even just for living, the very plain living. And um, those, those of their house, they have to sleep in the street, and then quite a few of them even start to live. Okay, it was reported widely in the newspaper just shortly before the 228 incident. Next. Okay, I like this story very much. It was written in a 228 incident book by a Chinese journalist. And uh, I think he, he probably was not very sympathetic to Chiang Kai-shek regime and may not be a communist either. I, I really don't know. And what he said in his book was this uh, paragraph. Okay. Once he asked his chambermaid in the hotel where he stayed, he said, why do you always call me Chinese? Aren't you a Chinese too? The chambermaid is a Taiwanese. He had, she answered, no, I'm a Taiwanese, even back in 1947. So if you think that some of the Taiwanese now still don't think this way, with the chamber made back in 1947. Answer this way. And then the reporter asked, Taiwan is the province of China. Since you are a Taiwanese, you should be a Chinese too. Doesn't Taiwan belong to China? The chamber made answered, no, Taiwan does not belong to China. Okay. So the reporter or the journalist asked, why? Does Taiwan belong to Japan? The chairman answered, no, Taiwan does not belong to Japan either. Taiwan belongs to the Taiwanese. I was very impressed, even back in 1947. And it was written by a Chinese journalist. Okay, next please. Okay, with all of this as a background, and the flash point arrived on the eve of February 28th, that was February 27th. Six agents from the Tobacco and Alcohol Monopoly Bureau seized the woman's cigarette vendors, her cigarette and the cash, the cash she obtained by selling the cigarettes. And an agent, among the six agents, beat the vendor over the head with a pistol, very heavy, and she was injured, uh, seriously injured. And an onlooking, angry crowd rushed toward the agent, and uh, the agents began to flee. And one of the green agents opened fire and killed one bystander. Uh, why I call him bystander? Because he was not among the crowd. He was just curious and uh, walked out of his house and looking at there and uh, all of a sudden the bullet just came and he was killed right away. Okay. And this vendor who was seriously injured was sent to the hospital by the crowd but died a few hours later. Next please. Okay. Now this place is uh, very well preserved and well marked in Taipei. Uh, that's a good tea house called Tenma, Tenma Tea House. And uh, the incident happened right in front of this tea house. Next week. 
And after that, actually, there were quite a few kind of protests in the evening, and the crowd went to police station and to military police headquarters, but with no avail. That just cannot get anything done. So they become very angry. So the next day, February 28th, a crowd of about 2,000 gathered in front of the Tobacco Monopoly Bureau Taipei branch to demand that the agent in question, the one who fired the shot, should be handed over to the crowd. And then another large crowd marching for the Governor General Office. There was fire upon suddenly, without any warning, without any warning, and resulting in six protesters' death. Three of them were killed right away, and three were injured, but died shortly later. This is a picture of how many of you have seen before that uh, right in front of the Tobacco Monopoly, uh, Monopoly Bureau type of branch. Okay. The angry crowd actually took something from inside the office and burned it outside. That's why they were small and burned it and they were looking out the uh, fire. The next week. Okay. I actually want to, uh, to put a uh, image or photo of, of this broadcasting uh, station in so now is the uh, 228 Memorial Peace Park. It was a broadcasting station. And the Taiwanese went there and started to broadcast the incident to the entire island. Okay. And uh, as a result, because all Obviously, everyone in the island, cities or town or village, were so angry. So when they heard this broadcast, they all rose up and uh, take control of government office in cities and in town. And the young students began to organize teams to help maintain order in the street uh, because all the Chinese policemen, as I mentioned earlier, they have no experience in law enforcement. They were so scared, they had to escape and they went into hiding. Next, please. The following day, on March 1st, in Taipei, a committee was formed to investigate the incident on February 27th, just try to investigate. But the next day, March 2nd, the committee was enlarged and now called the committee to settle the Monopoly Bureau incident. And this committee actually comprised quite a few different uh, groups. Uh, some students, some legislators, and some other professionals, like uh, professors or lawyers, attorneys, and uh, physicians. And they spent a lot of time discuss, try to form some kind of uh, demand to the government. The government hope that uh, the situation in Taiwan can be improved. So you can see from March 2nd to March 7th, about five days, they finally got about uh, 40, 42 demands. Okay, they finalized it. And uh, with a delegate, bring this 42 event to Chen Yi, the governor. Uh, general, but Chen Yi even didn't look at it, just rejected right up, right away. Uh, quite an insult. So, actually, there's some story behind this. Maybe some of you have heard that it was first 32 demand, 32 demand, but because of uh, 
addition of some new delegates in the committee or some representatives, they are really questionable ones. So they purposely added a few more. So it ended up with uh, 42 remains. The next, please. Okay. Yeah, it's too long to uh, this is all of the 42 demand. So I guess this is three of them. Uh, this is a very, very basic demand. But at that time, it was already impossible for the Chinese to accept. The first thing is that they ask the qualified Taiwanese should be given a job in government office. The second one is freedom of speech, press, and association should be provided because they were deprived of the Taiwanese and the rights of aboriginals should be guaranteed. There are many other, but uh, I just listed these three. Okay, next please. In addition to the settlement committee in Taipei, when other city and town heard they all come up and organize their own local committee. Uh, many of them in the island. And uh, both the settlement committee in Taipei and other local com committees, they effectively practice self government in four or seven days um, in Taiwan, which included management of radio stations, transportation like railroad, buses, and uh, water, electricity supply, and uh, communication like telephone. The, all these infrastructures were well maintained and managed by this committee. And they also bought food and fuel from, from sources and then sold to the residents at affordable prices. As I mentioned earlier, because the inflation rate was terrible and many residents couldn't afford it. So the committee tried hard to obtain those things, the food and fuel from sources, and then sold to the region at affordable prices. And then, at almost every city and county, the first aid care team were organized to help those uh, who were injured by Chi Chinese uh, troops. Why so? Because even at the time, the settlement committee was working on the demand that Chinese soldiers or troops were shooting indiscriminately anyone on the street. Okay, so some of them get hurt. Next, please. Okay. What I have said before was about the settlement committee. Okay. The, the way I look at the 228 incident for two parts, one is the, the kind of taking over the government by the settlement committee and uh, also try to maintain order. But the other one is the army struggle. This is mostly in the central part of Taiwan. And many cities and towns, the brigades were formed to, for the purpose of protecting, protecting the residents and also maintaining order in the street. And some of you where we fought chance to, it, I know it is two airports, one near Kagi and another one near Fowei. And at other locations, like uh, in Taichung, the headquarters of the Chinese troops was uh, surrounded by this uh, brigade and uh, finally, the Chinese troops inside surrender. Next, please. In the, what is best known among those brigades was the 2 7 Brigade. I asked quite a few people why they call it 2 7. And uh, the best answer seemed to be because they consider February 27 was the day, not 28. So they call it 2 7 Brigade. And if it was formed in Taichung on March 6. After before March 6, there were already some kind of uh, brigade, but in on March 6 it was formally organized. And 
it was made up mainly of young students and Taiwanese soldiers who had been discharged after the Second World War. And I knew quite a few Aborigines, youth, youth the young Aborigines, participate also because I was 10 years old and I lived near the Kanxia, uh, Kanxian, a kind of barrack in Taichung. And at that time it was taken over by the Taiwanese. And the, the guard guarding that barrack was the uh, Aborigines. And I think we, we sneak out and look at them and that gave me a very uh, long-lasting impression. And then this brigade, they moved from Taichung to Bodhi. The reason on, on uh, March 12 was because the Chiang Kai-shek troop reinforcement already arrived in Taiwan and they started to kill, become mass murdering anyone they can encounter on the street and try to prevent unnecessary sacrifice of the Taichung citizen. They decided to move to the countryside for me or for me. And the Chiang Kai-shek reinforcement, they keep chasing them, so they were battle in between, and uh, the brigade was able to defeat them. Uh, that was on March 14. However, two days later, faced with shortage of ammunition, there's no more surprise from other places. So the leader of the brigade agreed to disband the brigade, and then all the members went home. Next, please. Okay, as I said, on March 8 and 9, about 20,000 to 30,000 army soldiers sent by Chiang Kai-shek arrived in Taiwan. And the mass killing began right after the pandemic in Geylang, uh, Kilong. And the mass killing lasted for over two weeks. And uh, following that, the Cheng Yi declared a really cleansing campaign that means they try to clean out anyone they don't like who live in the city and the country. And it's called British Cleaning Campaign, Qin Xiang, which was began on March 26th and it lasted for over one month. By this, by the mass killing and the British Cleaning, it was estimated about as many as 28,000 Taiwanese were killed. They include attorneys, musicians, business leaders, newspaper publishers, reporters, and uh, politicians. Next piece. We saw the uh, event, obviously there was lasting effect uh, in Taiwan, and I just did three of them. One is for decades after the incident, most Taiwanese fear political persecution if they criticize Chiang regime, so they just keep silent. And uh, because many Taiwanese leaders were killed, the Chiang regime gained effective, effective control of the island. But this last one, I think, is also a very important effect. Is some Taiwanese leaders fled to foreign countries, uh, Hong Kong and Japan, and began to advocate Taiwan independence. Next, please. After that, Chiang Kai-shek himself was defeated by the communist, by Mao Zedong. So he escaped to Taiwan, and uh, about that time, they imposed the uh, martial law which began on May 19, 1949. Just about uh, 
two two months after the two two eight. And lasted thirty eight years and fifty seven days uh, until July fifteen nineteen eighty eighty seven. And using the martial law and some other kind of bylaws, uh, very savage political suppression was carried out. And over 200,000 political reasons were imprisoned. And uh, as many as 4,000 dissidents were executed. I was thinking to edit a uh, photo of the Green Island. I was there, and now it looked a little bit better. When I was there, it was not uh, a kind of trying to clean up or, or make it like a, what they call the, the human right park yet at that time. And, and if we look at inside, you will know how the prisoners were uh, treated there. Next, please. Okay. Then finally, finally, the Taiwanese were able to have a chance to remember this incident and uh, try to have uh, a kind of transition, transitional justice I'll talk about later. And the park where the broadcasting uh, radio station was in there, uh, now renamed as the 228 Peace Memorial Park. And uh, a 228 Massacre Monument was erected there. It was designed by uh, Teng Sun Tsai. Next week. Okay, just last year, in, on December 5th last year, the Act on Promoting Transitional Justice was passed by the legislative man. And the act is aimed at removing authoritarian era, symbols and the retrying cases of injustice from that era. And almost everybody, I think, thinks that it is time to officially name Chiang Kai shek is bearing the largest responsibility for the 228 massacre. We will are still waiting for it. Next week. And then, this is the one which is still standing there uh, in Taipei, in, in the very center of the Taipei city. Which had to be uh, either demolished or, or changed to something else. Next, please. Okay, I just like to comment that. Uh, but in the past, maybe about three decades, since <coughs> Chang Qingpo died, uh, I think the democratization began after his death. And uh, so for about three decades, <coughs> good progress has been made in democratization. But, but what I think is the decolonization, because Taiwan was ruled as a colony by KMT or by Chiang Kai-shek and Chiang Ching Kuo. So a lot of things still remain. For example, the name of the street, the name of university, and even the currency still have all of this Chiang Kai-shek or even Sun yat -sen. So this must remain to be done in decolonization. Next to and uh, this is what I have given a lot of thought to it. What lesson were learned? Learn it in this instant. The people without a nation of their own could not escape being repeatedly oppressed and murdered by external rulers. The people in an annexed land, annexed by Chiang Kai shek could not receive fair treatment from the ruler. The people who dare not change their faith are bound to be controlled by faith. 
I guess that's the value, right? Nick? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wang. That was very, very helpful. Uh, I think it really gives us a, a good starting base to think about what has happened on February 28th and we kind of think about it all the time. Uh, next, we'd like to have uh, Dr. Charles Lamb uh, come talk about uh, Hong Kong and the present situation and how we proceed forward as well and uh, help them as well. Okay, thank you. Today, so I'm no political science expert, but I want to take this opportunity to give you a review of what happened in Hong Kong last year. All right, so here's a general outline of what I'm going to talk about. As you see, there are actually lots of things happening in Hong Kong last year. So what I'm going to do is to talk about what's the view from mainland China, what, what is the stance of Hong Kong, and then I'll give an, an overview of the most important political landmarks and things that happen in Hong Kong that might have long-lasting effects. And then I'll talk about um, what is the effect of these actions that have happened in Hong Kong that is affecting the mentality of Hong Kong people and what are the international uh, uh, reactions are. All right, so 20 years after the handover, so what has happened? Well, Hong Kong people have lived in under, well, before 1997, it was under colonial rule under the British. And in 1997, Hong Kong's handover back to China, mainland China. <coughs> And now it's the 20th anniversary. This past year, 2017, marks a very important year. Everyone in the world wants to look at how the system works 20 years since the handover. And so there is a lot of scrutiny. And with high scrutiny, it turns out that there is also a high, um, um, a high number of events of intervention of the PRC government on Hong Kong affairs that um, seems like that Hong Kong people are under a lot of pressure in banning over uh, what we're doing um, before and in compliance to what China wants us to do. Um, we can see less freedom across the board, press freedom, political freedom, especially, are very prominent, it's very visible. Um, there is also an intentional crackdown on the youth generation, especially those between the ages of 18 and 29. Um, they have been very active in the political scene and there is an intention, and a, a deliberate intention by the Chinese government to use the Hong Kong government machine to crack down on the political rights for this generation and their political inspirations. There is a high international scrutiny as a result and the city overall actually is surviving pretty well, otherwise the economy is really good, well it's not very livable though. Um, the housing prices are ridiculous. Basically Hong Kong now is the number one, well it's the number one city 
for unaffordability for many years. And this year it broke record again that if you don't eat, don't drink, don't do any entertainment, and just live on your salary, it would take you 19 years to buy an apartment. That is 19 years of not eating, not drinking, not doing anything at all. You just work and sit at home and do nothing. Not even buy a TV. That's 19 years. And as a reference, the second most expensive city on this list is Vancouver, Canada. And the number of years that is required to buy a house there is 12 years. So Hong Kong is by far the, the worst in the world. And you may wonder why the housing prices rise so much. Well, let's say the inflation or the investors to these real estate, the money did not come from Hong Kong. It came from somewhere else, and you probably guess it right where it came from. Okay, so let's start with the bad stuff first, and then we'll talk about what happens in Hong Kong. So, this is these two quotes were used the most to. Uh, describe what happened, what's the viewpoint from the PRC government on Hong Kong. <coughs> now, on the 20th anniversary handover, uh, of handover, uh, Premier Xi came from uh, Beijing to Hong Kong to give a speech. Now, usually, well, you know how the speeches are like, they would talk about how that, oh, China is great, and <coughs> the economy is great, and Hong Kong should just integrate to China right now, and you know, jump on board and take care, take the opportunity of the economy. But to most common people, now the, this first quote is the most important. Now you don't really need to read the, the quote carefully, just look at the, 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 the words that are highlighted in yellow. Sovereignty, security, challenge, power, authority, all the things that are related to holding onto the power as much as possible, don't challenge it. Alright? And anything that you do here, infiltration, sabotage, it crosses the red line. Well, I can tell you that Hong Kong people is not even there yet. Um, Hong Kong people is challenging the Chinese authority in a way to gain rights for Hong Kong people. It's not challenging in a way to disintegrate China or have any security threat to China. But if you look at this quote, you can see that the Chinese government is actually somewhat afraid of Hong Kong in a way that it kept on repeating um, these rhetoric that says Hong Kong people seem to want to topple the Chinese government. It, it's not bad. Um, and another one in the NPC report later on in the year in October, uh, Premier Xi also says that, well, this is actually a very interesting quote because everyone tried to analyze it and no one understands what's going on. It says the safeguarding of the central leadership's comprehensive jurisdiction over Hong Kong and Macau and that the special administrative region's high degree autonomy must be combined in an organic manner. Now, when you talk about food, I know what organic is. Talk about chemistry, I know what organic chemistry is. What do you mean by combining administrative duties in an organic manner? I have no idea. And neither does the press. Actually, the press ended up asking a ton of uh, Hong Kong officials and many Chinese officials, and each one of them came up with a different interpretation. But this is the central message. Okay, so you interpret it whatever way you want. All right, so from the international, international view, this is how Hong Kong stands right now. There are actually quite a lot of rankings, and I'm sure for Taiwanese people, you also care about how these rankings go according to, um, to, to, to different aspects. So the first one is actually uh, from Heritage Foundation based in Washington, D.C. This is the one that Hong Kong government always advertised. This is the first line of the advertisement about why people should invest in Hong Kong because Hong Kong is number one in economic freedom. It's the most free economy in the world. And this is, they just, well, there are many ways that they can do to make sure that people work for, for investment is totally free. It's fine. Everything else, they don't really care. Global competitiveness, yes, they care about the economy, they, they care about people investing in the city. So global competitiveness, it's still high. It's falling because of some other measures. So you can see that the next one is corruption perception. Corruption has actually increased in Hong Kong. It's gotten worse. However, 
the reason why Hong Kong stays about the same is just because the entire world went worse. <laughs> and so, um, it does not mean that Hong Kong isn't still good. And actually, for Hong Kong people, we actually see the increase in corruption. Now, if you look at the last three measures, you can see that things actually have got way worse. Democracy, press freedom, and the freedom in the world, these are, these are all international indices that indicate the freedom of the things that we care the most about. Whether we can, we can actually see news reports that are objective, whether we can actually exercise our democracy rights, all of these things actually gone, have gone way worse in the past few years. Okay, so let's talk about what happened in Hong Kong last year. Alright, so, 689, I'm sure this number you've seen before, and it's, I, I, as far as I know, there is a similar interpretation of this number in Taiwanese polit uh, politics as well. So, for here, what we have is that the previous chief executive, uh, Leung Chun Ying, he decided not to run, citing family reasons. Okay, it's usually something else, of course. We don't know what that is, but whatever. He decided not to run. Or maybe someone told him that he, he's deciding not to run. <laughs> so, we need to have a new election. Now, for this election, um, Hong Kong does not elect their governor directly. We have a committee of 1,200 people, tightly controlled by mainland Chinese interests. And um, in the previous war, we got 689 votes out of approximately 1,200. So we barely made through because there were competition. Um, actually, there is serious uh, hatred type competition between two mainland camps. And so we barely got through it. Um, and this time, there were actually four, initially four different candidates who decided to run. One of them did not get enough votes. And this one turns out to be the one that's most loyal to the Chinese government. She did not get enough votes. And um, there were and they, they ended up to be three candidates. One was a retired uh, justice. And then two, Harry Lam, and then the other one, were government ministers that they spent to the Hong Kong colonial era. And Caroline was one of them. Um, she got endorsed sort of implicitly by the Chinese government, and so eventually she won by um, she, she won by 777 votes, and so now her name is 777. Which you might you might sound like a lucky number, but in Anthony 7 it's also square word, so it, it's good and bad at the same time. So in her, in her acceptance speech, she said um, she wanted many fishers in the society. And um, she, she started her job on June, July 1st. So until now, it's only about eight months. So we still wait to see what happens. All right. And so that was pretty much the first incident in, um, in Hong Kong in 2017. And then after that came all the court cases that related to the umbrella movement. So as you remember, the umbrella movement actually happened in um, October, September, October 2014. Um, however, there were a lot of arrests and um, uh, court challenges since then, and they're still unresolved. So three years since then, we're still fighting in the court on um, all of these cases. Now, some of the problem cases I'm going to talk about here, there are too many of them. So, um, and they are done sort of sporadically. They come every few months, and then there might be a hearing, and then wait for a few months, there's a sentence, and then there is a challenge, and there's a appeal, and then you keep on waiting, and it drags on. So here, um, I want to talk about these three. Adam Chow, David Wong, and Joshua Wong, they are um, youth leaders at the time, all of them were students at the time. And these three were three of the most high profile student activists at the time and still is today. Um, in 2016, they were sentenced to like fair life sentences for um, actually for occupying the grounds in front of the government building. Not even inside the government building, it's actually just a plaza outside of the government building, and the government wants to kick them out, they put on uh, fences, and and they actually broke the fences and got in and occupied the lands. Um, 
They were sentenced to fair-by sentences, um, 81 sentences to 80 hours of community service, and another 120 hours, and, and another one for like three weeks of jail. That's it. And um, under the previous governor law, um, he pushed the chief justice to appeal for resentencing because they think that sentence is too weak. And even though they have served the sentence, and it's supposed to be done, you cannot have double jeopardy in the common law system, but he appealed. And in 17, they were sentenced to much tougher sentences for six to eight months in jail. And so they were in jail, um, and then um, their respective lawyers filed for appeal, they got released, and in fact, just last month, the Court of Final Appeal, which is the Supreme Court in Hong Kong, reversed the sentences. They, they decide to hear the sentence and they say that, okay, they have served the terms, they should not be resentenced again, and yes, there were guidance from the government, from the Justice Department, to say that these cases now, from now on, must be sentenced to higher jail terms, but it does not apply to these three because when they commit whatever offense that, that they, the government claims them to be, those jail term guidance were not in place. So they should not be jailed with six to eight months of jail, and they were immediately released. So that's sort of a bittersweet victory because they got released. However, it means that in the future, for any protests, for any Occupy uh, actions in Hong Kong, activists will face the jail term because the court actually agrees to that in the future. They would be sentenced to higher prison terms. And furthermore, um, 19 activists, and including Joshua Wong Yang, you will hear this name over and over again, I'm sure you are familiar with him already. Um, they are also sentenced for contempt of court for refusing to agree, for actually the um, umbrella movement. And that is actually, again, a tactical way of how the government tries to crack down on these activists. They did not initiate um, the charge, the, the push to clear to kick these people out from the streets. They hire, they, they get friendly people who are, who are landlords to say that you occupy in front of my apartment buildings or put in front of my businesses and they ask the court to clear them. So the government will be like, oh, I'm hands off, this is not my, my, my fault then. Well, you know. So they were, they were again, being uh, sentenced for contempt of court. They were not put into jail yet because everyone people immediately. So they are right now free pending on uh, court of final appeal hearing. And there are more pending cases, including these three, the three organizers, original organizers of Occupy Central, uh, Dr. Chen, Dr. Tai, and Reverend Chu. Uh, they, I think they have just got into the first hearing, which they, one of the sentences that they were charged for is to incite others, to incite other people. Okay, I'll give you a second to think about what it means. It's not to incite people to go and write, it's to incite people to incite people. So there was one, one of the charges, and there were some other charges as well. Okay, so another court case. This actually happened before Occupy Central. This happened in June uh, 14, and it was purely an environmental, a uh, community protection protest. The government tries to um, tries to get funding to develop an area that is sort of rural, that still preserves um, some agricultural activities in the northern end of Hong Kong, and they want to change it to a another real estate development. These activists came and stormed the legislative council grants. They broke in the door, not inside the chamber, but they basically just entered into the building. And again, in, uh, in 2016, they were sentenced to community service, and then in 17, they were sentenced to 8 to 13 months of jail, and most of them are right now in jail, they were not released. Some of them filed appeal, but not all of them were released at this point. At this point. Um, and this also is something that um, that, that gets um, most people very angry because this activity was not even political. They were just challenging, they were just protesting and challenging the, um, the government on environmental protection. 
And the police says that during this confrontation, uh, some policemen got kicked in the leg or something and they got hurt. And so now they deserve sentences for 8 to 13 months. So we don't know. And this judge that passes through uh, this sentence says, in the judgment, actually it's written on record, you can actually look it up online, it says, in recent years an unhealthy wind has been blowing in Hong Kong. We have never seen such weird English language in a judgment before. So he basically just translated from, from the Chinese words Wai Feng into unhealthy wind. And basically it's not about a joke for white people. All right, so some other thing stuff during the uh, umbrella movement, one of the activists was dragged by seven policemen to a dark corner, and then they basically kicked him and somehow got caught in the camera. Guess what? They were charged sentence to two years in prison. Now they are right now also released pending appeal because everyone has a right of appeal. And other retired policeman was also, as you see in the bottom, um, he was also caught in camera using the stick using the baton on passers-by. These people were not even protesters, they were just passing by and he used the stick to hit everyone. Um, and he is also found guilty, he was sentenced to three months in prison, um, again, pending appeal. All right, <coughs> so now this is, um, after the umbrella movement, now we talk about um, what happened in the legislation. Now, legislation also is going through serious turmoil. Um, so, I have to uh, give a, a background of what happened when a legislator got elected and then they take the oath to office in the legislation. For the Pan Democrats, year after year, it's always the same. Since 1997, it's always the same. There were a few uh, elected um, legislators that would take the oath and insert words or play with words, or do some actions that makes it clear their opposition to the PRC government. And then what happens is that the legislature will say that, okay, you're taking over, it's invalid, let's take it again, and then they will just take it as usual. And basically it's just like a game, a show off, and so on. Okay, so this year what happened is that six of them did the exact same thing. Four of them took the oath again. And the chair of the legislature says, okay, well, let's move on. Two of them, the first two that you see to your left, they did not. Well, the reason is when they took the oath, they actually carried a banner that says Hong Kong is not China. <laughs> and the second one actually not only does, did that, when she said People's Republic of China, somehow the Republic the word republic became the F word. <laughs> and that angered a lot of people. She claimed that her English is not good. <laughs> it didn't work. So, so the, the pro China people, of course, got very angry and they complained. And what happened is that he eventually got to the NPCSC, the, the National People Congress Standing Committee. He says, okay, you can't do that anymore. They reinterpreted the oath taking law. Basic, well, it's not exactly Basic Law Article 104. Basic Law, basic law Article 104 basically simply says that, okay, you have to take the oath. Done. What they said is that, from, um, that for oath taking, if your intention is not right, will disqualify you. If you did not take the oath seriously, will disqualify you. If you do not use the exact same words, will disqualify you. And not only from now on, but retroactively to July 1st, 1997. So you only have one chance to take the oath in office. And if you make a single mistake, sorry, you're done. And this is the way that they did to disqualify these six, these six people. Now, the first to explain to you what happened, let's look at the fourth, that is um, Nathan Law. She, he simply said the following. When he said, I'm... I, um, I take the uh, I respect the basic law and the People's Republic of China. He said People's Republic of China. That's all. Turn the intonation up as if it's a question. Disqualified. That's it. And so suddenly we have lost 
we have lost um, uh, six legislators, just like that, on the pan democratic side. Right now, I'm going to go through the re-election re of four of the six contested seats um, because two of them decided to appeal for re-ruling. So those two are not up for re-election yet, but four of them are being re-elected, uh, be being up for re-election, and it's going to happen on March 11th. Um, three candidates were disqualified by election officers during this period of nomination period. So during the nomination period, many people came to run for office again. Um, there is sort of an understanding between Pan Democrats to nominate only one against whoever that other people come up with, but well, there are people on both sides that decided to run not listening to the rules. We don't know what's going to happen and whether those people are actually planted by some of the entities or not, we don't know. So I'm not going to plant any con uh, conspiracy theories here. You know, weird things happen. But during this period, uh, three nominees were disqualified due to their stance on either self-determination or independence of Hong Kong. Now, in particularly, um, this um, person um, illustrated here is Agnes Chowting. Uh, Agnes Chow um, is currently a member of the party that was CISO, which is the party that's also associated with Nathan Law and, um, and Joshua Wong. Their party talks about self-determination of Hong Kong people under the rule of PRC China. Not self-determination for independence. It's a self-determination of how Hong Kong should be governed when China is the master. And with that, they say no, because when you talk about self-determination, that means Hong Kong can be independent. No challenges. They don't even allow challenges. They just say that no, you cannot run. And, and in fact, she's actually very high profile. And so this angers Hong Kong. And in fact, just like in many elections, actually just like these actually help the pan-democrats. They get more votes because of these. And so I don't know what's going on, but they do it year after year, every single time. They make things like these to actually increase the voter turnout of the pan-democrats. Um, but what I want to say here is that Francisco actually represents the, the activists in the 20s who are actually willing, in a way, to cooperate with the Chinese government. But they just want more independence in a way that they can <coughs> say. And by disqualifying her, that means they're disqualifying the party altogether, and this kills off a whole generation of youth activists. Well, before the election, right now, the opposition, which is the Pan Democrats, actually lost the uh, majority in geographic constituencies. And in the way that the legislation goes, that also means that um, the Pan Democrats lost the veto power to anything and everything. Now, before that, they already did not have veto power on government bills. And now they lost the veto power on all bills, even with private member bills. And this is when all these, what we call, call pro-establishment people, or pro-China, pro-PRC people, came to play. They never liked the pan Democrats. They don't like the actions in the legislature. So they proposed a rule book change to further curb their rights to debate in the legislature. They lowered the, they lowered the quorum for a meeting from 35 to 20. So all you need is the 29% attendance and the legislature can go in session. Now we wonder why is it helping the, the, the pro-China people when they have the majority. The reason is that the pro-China constituents, uh, the, the legislature consists of a lot of businessmen, they never show up. And so there have been many, many times that the legislative council cannot happen because these pro-China people were not there and they do not have the quorum to start the meeting. And so by lowering this, basically all the businessmen, all the pro-China people are not showing up and they can still have the meeting going on. Now they can enter the bus. Before that, as long as you just talk, you can kill the bill. 
now. The chair can kill the bastard. And when the quorum is not reached, it used to be that you have to wait for the next session, which is a week later. And so you can drag on things if people keep on not showing up to a legislature. You can keep dragging on the bill until <coughs> the government gives up, saying, we're done. Well, what they can do now is that, oh, quorum not reached, fine. Let's wait for an hour, we're we'll having a meeting. And so now it basically hastens the, the speed. They just have one hour and call everyone to, to show up and then they can have the meeting and pass whatever crazy deals that they want. But the last one is one that really angers me, is that before that, if you want to set up an investigative government, uh, an investigative committee on any government probes to see any government wrong doing, all you need is 20 legislators' signature in order to start a committee. Now they want 35. And Democrats do not have 35 seats. 35 is half, they don't have half the seats. And so, in other words, no more government probes in the future. Government can do whatever, if they are found to wrong the way, there's no investigation that's going to happen. Um, another big high, uh, controversy is the high speed rail John checkpoint. <coughs> um, high speed rail is sent to Hong Kong. Eventually, it, it's expected to start running in fall. Um, the problem is that there's immigration control for both jurisdictions. And what the PRC wanted is to have the joint uh, checkpoint for immigration and leaving in West Kowloon Station, which is in the land of Hong Kong. And if you board the train in Hong Kong, in the West Kowloon Station, you leave Hong Kong and enter China right away. And while you're waiting for a train still on Hong Kong land, Chinese laws will apply. And this is something that we don't even know if it's illegal. The Chinese government says it's legal, Hong Kong law experts say says it's not legal, and Chinese government says that, well, we are the law. Um, we don't know how it's going to turn out um, because the legislation part on the Hong Kong part is not completed, um, but we expect to see more challenges. And the one is the legislation of national anthem law. If you follow the news, you see that Hong Kong people like to uh, boo the Chinese national anthem during every international match. It's widely reported in the news. Um, Chinese government decided to legislate the law and asked Hong Kong government to do so. Now, this is actually a big headache for um, for, for everybody, including FIFA, the uh, International Federation of Soccer, because uh, usually when we hear people boo the, the, the national anthem is to, to actually jeer the, the opposing team. It has never happened to a group that jeered their own national anthem. It has never happened before. So to, to the international government body, this is also a headache. They, they don't even know how to act to that. All right, and other issue is the Corporate Bay Books Kidnapping. Um, the bookstore has been publishing books that are highly crit critical of um, presidency, and uh, five members of the bookstore have been kidnapped, one way or the other, uh, while inside China or outside China. But the most important one is actually going in high right now because all the other four are relatively safe. Uh, Lamin Key is actually right now in Hong Kong. He's still sometimes being followed, but at least he's in Hong Kong, to say. Wei Bing Hai is actually a Swedish citizen. He holds a Swedish passport. And he was snatched in Thailand in 16, disappeared in Thailand. How he got from Thailand to, to mainland China, nobody knows. But now he's still in mainland. In, and in January 18, he actually was accompanying with um, Swedish diplomats on a train to Beijing. And on the way, um, Chinese special forces came in, the secret police came in, and snatched him right in front of the Swedish diplomats. And then a few days later, you see another confession on TV, whether it's for, for or not, well, your own interpretation. <coughs> All right, another, this is a funny one, between me education. Um, Sometime in the middle of the year, the uh, basic law committee chairman, Li Fei, decided to give a speech on TV. 
And for some reason, the Department of Education never had done this before urged schools to actually broadcast this and ask the students to assemble together to watch it. Um, only 10% of the secondary schools uh, complied to do this, and um, press went to a few schools and realized that most of the students are actually dozing off during speech. But this is something that um, we expect to see more often, is to force the schools, or force the students to actually learn the speeches by um, various leaders of the RC. Okay, and here this is one that I think might uh, try to talk with, with Taiwan as well, um, uh, as there are rumors of formalized relationship between the Vatican and PRC. Um, it might happen in a month or two. Um, Cardinal Sen, uh, the Sixth Bishop of Hong Kong, actually has been going around the world talking about this issue. He's highly critical of the way that uh, Pope Francis has been carrying out, and he, in, in fact, he has expressed his um, his opinion that maybe uh, maybe uh, Pope Francis was not the one entirely behind this. Um, but he is going to speak against this until um, uh, uh, until something happens. Um, and um, he actually came um, a few months ago to speak to Hong Kong Forum on this matter as well, and other matters with. Relation to the relationship between PRC and the Vatican. Um, and uh, he's highly vocal. So if you look up to his, um, to, to, to his uh, uh, articles, you'll find a lot about his views. Okay, so where do Hong Kong people stand up to all these? I'll quickly go through some of the polls that, um, that has um, uh, done in the past that indicates how Hong Kong people stand and how Hong Kong people see themselves in relation to PRC China. Uh, ethnic identity is one measure that we always talk about. When do, are you a Hong Konger or are you a Chinese? And as you see over the past 20 years, nothing much has changed. Most of them still identify as a Hong Konger or a Hong Konger in China, and then, and then uh, some people identify as Chinese first, and then Chinese and Hong Kong are Chinese. Uh, this has not really changed much, but if you look at how you identify as Hong Konger, you see that the yellow line on the top, that's the youth generation, 18 to 29. Now, I want to point out those group, that group explicitly because this group were educated after the handover. They were educated when Hong Kong is the city of China. You can see that it's an increasing percentage of the youth generation identified themselves as Hong Kong rather than um, Chinese. 70, it's close to about 70% of 18 to 29 identified themselves as Hong Kong. Um, whereas 30 plus, which is the orange line at the bottom, it's about 30%. I can tell you that me, as the one that the right belonging to the orange line, under the British colonial rule, we actually identify ourselves more Chinese. And I can see the youth generation changing their view. They do not identify themselves as much like the Chinese. So, um, in a way, the education system, in the sense of the PRC government, was actually very angry. They were like, why, is, why are people like, identifying themselves less and less Chinese? Um, after the hand handover, when Hong Kong is actually part of China. Now, this is the graph that shows how people when they identify themselves as Chinese. So, for the 30 plus, you can see that it's at about 18 percent. 18 percent of Hong Kong people ages 30 and above identify themselves as Chinese first, or solely Chinese. For 18 to 29, you can see that it rose actually quite a bit when China was good doing economically well. And then when China starts infringing the Hong Kong rights, now, this latest one was done in January 2018. The percentage was 0.3%. 0.3% <laughs> Hong Kong people in the ages 18 to 29 identify themselves as Chinese. Now, on the question of whether they're competent in one country, two systems, uh, it's actually half and half. It was more confident in the, um, in the last decade, but as umbrella movement came, things started to fade away, 
and now you can see that it's up and up. About 50% thinks that they're confident and 50% thinks that it's, they're not confident. Um, I don't have a demographic breakdown, but I believe that the breakdown is also according to age groups as well. And whether they are confident whether China has a future, um, surprisingly, uh, majority still thinks that there is a future. Um, about 70% still thinks China has a good future, and about 20% thinks that it's not the, the, the net value is about 50%. Now, another poll by done by Chinese University of Hong Kong, you can see that on the future development of Hong Kong is again half and half, but it's an um, a optimistic outlook or pessimistic outlook. However, 20%, full 20% of Hong Kong people want to emigrate. And um, as Jerry mentioned, is that uh, a lot of them actually consider moving to Taiwan. You can, um, in Hong Kong newspapers, actually, there has been articles every month about how life, how life is much better for Hong Kong people living in Taiwan. And we don't want to invade you, but you guys are just better in a way to deliver. Um, as for uh, maintain one country system beyond 2047, because Hong Kong was, um, was guaranteed 50 years of no change. So Hong Kong people right now still majority wanted to keep one country two systems beyond 2047. Um, very few want direct governance by China as it is now just a city in China. Um, the independence of Hong Kong, the support is very low. It's about 11% support only, 60% is against. And whether, on the question whether they believe Hong Kong independence is possible, a full 84% do not believe Hong Kong independence is possible at this moment. All right, so on the US government, there's no action from the White House. Um, I'm sure that White House is busy with a lot of other things. Uh, but on the Congressional Executive Commission of China, um, a, a lot has been happening. I believe uh, the congressman in this area is also part of the committee, right? So, uh, it's Jun Jun Chi. Is it? Oh, so maybe the next one. Yeah, Jun Chi is. Yeah. Okay, Jun Chi is not, I think, but uh, Ed Royce is. Oh, Ed Royce is not here, but he's, he's, he's down the down the like, down the down the down Okay. Down the yeah. All right, thank you. So yeah, I, I don't live in this area, I live two hours away. Uh, so there has been a hearing on the 20th anniversary of Hanover. Uh, Dr. Wong Wong was one of the speakers together with two other speakers. Um, there was a uh, statement on the 20th anniversary of Hanover and um, when the jail of the umbrella movement activists came out, uh, they also released a harsh statement on that. Um, but what has happened is that there has been a House Resolution 422 it's basically just a verbal thing urging um, the, uh, China to adhere to the one country, two system policy. There's a bill that's happening, and we actually need support from everybody to push the congressman to work on this. This is HR 3856 on Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act of 2017. One of the provisions in this act is to make sure that in the future, any vow for, if the Hong Kong government has any violation of human rights on uh, in, in Hong Kong, all the uh, officials that are involved in these acts will have their assets frozen and they will also not be allowed entry to the United States. And so this is actually a very harsh um, uh, 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 law to, to punish government officials that are involved in prosecuting the umbrella movement activists or any other civil rights activists in Hong Kong. And so we, we really urge you to work with your congressman to let them know of this bill and hopefully it will pass before the end of this congressional session. And another thing that uh, we're pretty really happy about is that um, ex Chinese in law, Joshua Wong, and the anti group Democracy Movement was nominated by 12 uh, bipartisan congressmen and senators to the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, so we wish them good luck on that. All right, so this year, we'll see the continual action um, on the Hong Kong government to try to curb uh, democracy rights and civil rights in Hong Kong. So we're all going to keep a watch on that. As for the Hong Kong citizens, whether it's uh, Hong Kong citizens have given up or they have to be under a pressure cooker waiting to explode, we are not sure. I tend to believe that it's under a pressure cooker. But, well, we'll see how it goes. All right, so thank you.